Okay. Uh, welcome back to Senate Education. So S-172, an act relating to education and Bill of Rights for children who are deaf, part of hearing or deaf blind. Senator Ashim has been working on this, and we have, uh, we've asked him for an update. So Senator Hashim, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, so I've got several points, I think, uh, for any future discussion uh, as we go through the actual language of the bill, we'll probably want to hear from the Board of Education, the Human Rights Commission, and uh, some other folks who've actually had experience, uh, lived experience with these issues. And, and the reason I mentioned the Human Rights Commission is, you know, this was mentioned in their report, uh, you know, creating this right. compendium of legislation. And so, you know, hearing from them, and, you know, they also have a jurisdiction over uh, Public Accommodations Act uh, lawsuits. And so I think regarding some of the points I'm going to raise, it might be good to hear from them as to where the gaps uh, do exist in that accountability process. But yeah, so some of the general points, I think, from what I'm seeing is, you know, the one of the most important issues has to do with accountability and the complaint procedure as it relates to folks who are reaching out to the agency of education and going through the process of uh, you know trying to make sure that their that their child is you know getting the support and help that they need um, you know my understanding is that there are a lot of challenges with that and sometimes you know the procedure is either confusing or you know they're not hearing back and you know I think that you know I mean the, the question I have is you know how much of that is a legislation issue versus a capacity issue at AOE or uh, you know a workforce issue at AOE and just to clarify that's not me throwing AOE under the bus I'm just saying it seems like there's things that are getting lost in the weeds uh, during this complaint procedure. Um, so just to clarify, yeah. here, so um, the young woman we heard from last week, her family filed a complaint mm -hmm. and the agency of education, and then something yeah. didn't happen, right? Is that? It, it sounds like that's something that's happened multiple times okay. with different families. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, a list of testimony or stories uh, that I could actually provide to Morgan and we can put it on our page but you know different instances of this happening uh, with different families so where they're going to the AOE and then something again not throwing anybody in the butt, but something's not happening yeah so yeah there's some sort of disconnect and there's you know they're not yeah yeah you don't happen to know and I don't remember if we heard this from anyone yet, but AOE, their point person on this, do we know who that would be? Did she testify? I thought that she testified. I thought we had somebody in yeah. here who was sitting uh -huh. and right in the corner. Yeah. It, okay. Yeah, and then she did testify. Because I think she came up to us afterward and said, hey, I'm going to look into this. But, okay. That's, that, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. Um, and then the... Yeah, so, let's see what else? Uh, another one of the points, uh, you know, focusing on the American Sign Language proficiency, it, that it should be a prereq prerequisite for, uh, for teachers who have the cert for uh, deaf and the hard of hearing certifications. Uh, the teachers who do have that certification should have the ASL proficiency as a prerequisite, and and I, and I think again that ties into the the need for us to hear from the students who are in these classrooms with these teachers who do want to learn American Sign Language but just aren't able to because the the teacher doesn't have that certification. And just to clarify, so these are students who may not be of deaf and hard of hearing, 
but they want to learn ASL or no? Not quite. No, okay. it's no, it's that there are children that the, the children who are deaf and hard of hearing and who have teachers who are not sign language certified or proficient uh, just aren't aren't experiencing the opportunity to learn American Sign Language because that teacher doesn't have that certification. And then I think the when we get more into, I'm starting to see the patterns here with uh, curriculum and what we do legislate versus what we don't. And you know, I, I'm seeing that you know some of the some of the issues are brought up in the rule series 2360, and uh, actually, one second. Or rather, they aren't brought up in rule 2360, and so I think that. Well, yeah, no, I I don't want to make assumptions about what is or isn't in the rules because uh, this is why I think we should also hear from the Board of Education regarding the rule series and what is already in law or the rules because we know that the rules have the force of law. You know, what exists in those rules that is described in the statute and trying to figure out where the gaps may exist there and, and what is trying to be accomplished uh, by trying to change those rules, but you know we don't. You know, it's my understanding we we are not the ones who legislate the rule series. That's the board of education, right? Mm -hmm. So, right, so yeah. and I, I think that the you know like the IDEA, uh, you know we we can. Sorry. Uh, you know, we can create similar analogs, you can call them, you know, that mirror federal law and have them be in state law as well, uh, you know, as an enforceable set of rules or set of statutes. And that, you know, I want to double check the language in the bill itself as it relates to whether or not we are recreating those federal statutes or if we're simply saying that that the that that, diff, that different schools have to follow those federal statutes I'm not it's not 100 it, it's not quite clear with the language but that's a Beth St. James question um, I think so, so yeah so that's 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 what I'm. That, that's those are my initial thoughts. Um, and just to close, I think again that Board of Education, Human Rights Commission, and a couple more folks with lived experience of going through this process to figure out where the cracks are. Um, and you know, again, the Human Rights Commission. This was one of their recommendations. And so hearing, oh, Amanda or Amanda Garces was. Think supposed to submit testimony. Um, I asked her if she would be available today, and she's not. But okay. following up with her, and she's a, she's a human rights commission, right. or she uh, she is she? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So I think following up with her to hear from that organization mm -hmm. as to what they're seeing as the gaps as well. I think could be helpful. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we're looking to understand where some of the gaps are. So we'll have Amanda Garces in. And do you think the State Board of Education will help us be helpful in terms of understanding the gaps? I mean, they might be, or just... Yeah, I mean, there are I'm some recommendations sure that I think would go into the rule series rather than legislation. Okay. And, I mean, if, if it's a request that we send to the board to you know make some changes, I'm not sure how that rulemaking process goes, or rather if it's a group of citizens who have to petition the Board of Education to make those rule changes. Uh, I guess that's that's the remaining question. Uh, so 
would you be if we had? I think the person who can probably answer that best might not be a state board member, but Emily Simmons, AOE's ledge counsel, and I think she also she also supports the state board. Yep. Have her zoom in, and, and we can ask her that question around rulemaking, and then Amanda Garces can come in, yep. and then you can provide us some more information from families around again the gaps that you're seeing or that they're yep. seeing out there. Yeah, I, I have a document that I can provide to Morgan. We can. Print it and okay. share it with everybody. They did also send a uh, petition over that includes 75 Vermont residents. Uh, and from what I can gather from the chart, I, th I believe the second or third highest listed issue, or you know, the, the question was why do you support this bill? And I as far as I can tell, it's either the second or the third highest reason is because, quote, the educational system does not sufficiently accommodate the needs of uh, deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind children, with number one being this is a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd still like to understand, and we can always talk to them on or offline, what sort of happened, if parents are reaching out to AOE, it sounds to me like they might need to streamline something. The interpreter, just double checking, Please. what was the number one reason that you said? The number one reason? Uh, this is a human rights issue. Thank you. Thanks for asking. And also just for uh, transparency, the total number of responses were 108. 75 were Vermont residents and 33 were outside of Vermont, so I'm, I'm not sure from where, but that's this is what they what else provided. But. Yeah, okay. So for you, next step, Emily Simmons, Human Rights Commission, and uh, some students or some, some families yeah. testify. Okay. I think that makes sense. Yeah, I understand where the gaps are. Yeah, there, oh, and, and I also want to add the uh, for what I think would end up being included in the rule series are the more uh, cultural and curriculum, uh, the, the, the requests that are related more so to culture and curriculum, which I, I think would go into the rule series rather than law. And you had mentioned, I think, that Maine had done this. Yeah, Maine and also uh, New Hampshire. I think there were, was it, I think it was 18 states in total, if not okay. more. What was the big pushback last week or the week before on this? I mean, we heard the, uh, well, I, I think it was two weeks ago now. Uh, I think we heard that it was uh, redundant mm -hmm. and that, you know, these laws are already in place. but. Then when we look at the testimony of the kids and their parents, you know, it's there's there's clearly a disconnect because the people who these laws are meant to protect and accommodate are not experiencing that protection and accommodation from those laws based on the experiences that they're describing. And do we know from Beth St. James, did she say it was redundant? Perfect timing. Senator Kula, please, you had a question. Uh, Ms. St. James, please join us at the table. I was just, I think I was gonna echo pretty much what you were saying, which is can we find out if it is in law? And um, because it does seem as though we've come across this issue before where something's in law but it's not being done and what's the responsibility of the AOE in making sure that it does get done? Like, there just seems to be a lot of confusion around that. It'd be nice to... It'd be nice to know who that one yeah. person is in AOE. And I think we met her, but I don't remember her name. We're talking about S-171, it's Senator Lachine's bill. Please, Senator Williams. So we Oh, sorry. Well, 172, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, and I've, I've asked this question before, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I'm... You know, if it, if it's happening to deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind people, yeah. is it happening to blind people too? And I know that you, that's not your your uh, constituents' focus, but if if we're going to talk about 
mandates that apply to that group are are the blind people having the same problem? I think the so I, I think that was raised two weeks ago and the answer as best as I can remember has to do with the fact that folks who are in the deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind community you know have have their own culture have their own language and unlike what you see with folks who are blind uh, you know I, I do think there I I wouldn't be surprised if there was overlap in the issue regarding the accountability piece and the complaint procedures, but I think that you know the second component of this bill regarding culture and curriculum, I don't think that overlaps with, with the blind piece. So yeah, does that yeah. I'm just I'm just concerned from an equity equity standpoint yeah. that if we're gonna be mandating it for one group, we should be making sure that everybody's covered. That's yeah, and if you don't mind Putting a mental note yep. as we go forward, okay. and we'll loop folks in on right. that. Thank you, Mr. James. We, if you don't mind, before we get started on what we have you in for, which is 191, 172. We have a question. We heard that the language in 172. And I think we heard it from the agency a couple weeks ago. Is redundant that it's not needed, and I kind of remember you being in the chair and answering this already. But would you mind helping us out? Sure, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, so I am not um, able to speak to whether the entire bill is redundant or oh, not. But sure. generally speaking, um, if a child, if a student qualifies for special education services either under IDEA or Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, um, many if not all of these components may be a part of a 504 plan or an um, IEP. Um, you know, the federal special education laws require um, students to be provided with, um, you know, a free appropriate, it's FAPE, and I always haven't been in the education world long enough to remember FAPE. It's probably not a great, um, free and appropriate public education um, in the least restricted environment. So um, it's possible that in order to provide a child with a free and appropriate education in the least restrictive environment, school districts are already required to offer many of these services. Now, if a student does not qualify for an IEP or Section 504 plan, there are other non-federal components to special education provisions um, and, and also supports in the general classroom. I'm thinking multi-tiered systems of support um, and um, Act 173, even creating that new definition of students who are needing additional support, which would be outside of the um, special education context as far as IDEA and Section 504. So um, I can't, I am not qualified to sit down and say, okay, subdivision four is automatically provided for under IDEA or Section 504 or um, it would be a requirement under, you know, a, a tier two supports and a multi-tiered system of support. Um, but my guess is if you're hearing that this bill is redundant, that that is, that is part of it, is okay. that um, if a student qualifies for any extra support, it's possible that all of these supports would already be provided. <clears throat> It's possible. I'm, yeah, not, I'm yeah, not saying not that this, and, yes, and there could be a population of students who would qualify for supports under this bill very specifically um, that would not qualify um, under Section 504 or right. IDEA. Okay. Um, or perhaps they would qualify for extra support in the general classroom setting, but maybe if not all of these items are required, maybe not all of them would be offered. So. I, I think there's That's potential helpful. for overlap and yeah. also some not overlap. So yeah. we've asked 
we're going to ask Ms. Garces to come in to help us understand the gaps that she's hearing next week, and we're also going to hear from Emily Simmons to see if she wants to weigh in on or ask her about rulemaking. And, and, and she might be able to. She might. Have you heard from someone from the special education department? I believe that's who we had in next okay. last week, but I'll okay. check with Morgan. Yeah. And as with. Uh, yeah, Ms. Uh, I can't remember her name. Um, I, I don't want to say what. Yeah. I just emailed to try to find out. And yeah. as with anything, you know, it's not whether you're how you ask questions sometimes makes or breaks whether you get the information mm -hmm. that you need, right? So if you want to know if everything in this bill would be provided for someone who automat who qualified for services under IDEA or Section 504. Maybe you have to ask specifically, would subdivision six be part of okay. an IEP or a 504 plan if a student was deaf, deaf blind, or hard of hearing? And you know, just saying generally, you know, it's redundant, right? Like, just what, does yeah. what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Senator Machine Porcello, Porcello, make Porcello, make Porcello. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll hold my question for now, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll hold my question okay. for now, but thank you. She did submit five pages of testimony, yeah. too. So um, anything else on 172 at this point? It sounds like we're working away on it for once. Yeah. Um, and now we'll shift to 191. Thank you, Senator Sheen. Anything else from your end? No, I'm, I'm good. I think. Uh, Thank you, Beth, for the uh, for the note. I think I, I think one piece is making sure that this applies to not just deaf students, but also hard of hearing and deaf blind students. I think that is one of the that that might be one of the gaps. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to have to rewatch the testimony, but you know, it was from two weeks ago now, but. And I'll yeah. try to rewatch them. It also, and would you, in the bill, just unless Senator Hashim objects, uh, Senator uh, Williams has raised issues of people who are blind. I just want to lose sight of that. If you could just make a note somewhere. Sure. The bill is very specific about services for one particular uh, group right. of people. So I would need a lot of direction on what right, why services would now, be required. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just want to. Use that request in that question. Okay. 191, uh, an act relating to new American uh, advancement grant app applicants. And we have a revised version, I believe, after we heard from uh, Tom Little from VSAC. So, yeah, but. And. So I think we'll go ahead then, uh, Ms. St. James, if you want to take us through the changes. Sure, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel, you should have um, a potential amendment, uh, draft 1.1 1 .1, uh, to S191. So this would be the first change to the bill that you've seen since the bill was introduced. And this is based solely on feedback and um, suggestions from Tom Little from uh, VSAC's General Counsel. Um, so the bill on page one, sub section D, the changes are highlighted in yellow. So notwithstanding subsection A of the section, which is talking about um, who qualifies for an advancement grant. So it would be the term resident is what we're really focused on here. Um, applicants who qualify for in-state tuition to the Community College of Vermont pursuant to subsection 2185C of this section shall not be ineligible for the advancement grant solely on account of the applicant's residency status. So if they haven't been here for a year, that's if that's the only reason they would be ineligible, that can't that that non-year residency piece. Um, would not make them ineligible. If they're not eligible for other reasons, this does not um, this does not automatically qualify them for an advancement grant. And we're 
talk about who them is in a second. But that it is not ineligible. I know that's not the most elegant writing, um, but it's basically saying if you meet every other requirement but you haven't been here a year, you're eligible. Okay. okay. So who is eligible? So in 2022, um, and uh, the legislature passed an amendment to the determination of residency for tuition purposes for the Vermont State Colleges, specifically the Community College of Vermont. And so that language says, for determination of res residency for tuition to Community College of Vermont, a person who resides in Vermont shall be considered a resident for in-state tuition beginning at the start of the next semester if that person, and then this is the category of folks that would qualify for this advancement grant um, if they haven't been here for a year but they, but they meet all the other eligibility requirements. So someone who qualifies as a refugee pursuant to the federal definition of a refugee. Mm -hmm. Someone who has been granted parole to enter the United States pursuant to, I believe this is the humanitarian parole federal definition, or is issued a special immigrant visa pursuant to the Afghan Allies Protection Act of 2009. So if an individual met all of the other advancement grant eligibility requirements and fell into one of those categories, if they hadn't been here for a year, they would still, they could still qualify for an advancement grant. That, that one year residency piece would not kick them out of eligibility, okay. exclude them, yes. And then, um, so the, the bill is introduced, it was the same concept to a much broader category of people. It listed just um, several um, immigration statuses. Um, but such. Can I interrupt real quick? I'm not seeing the, uh, the language in the bill is introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, on so this section D here, am I am I blind or is it not in this potential amendment? It is. It, it is. You, so this amendment is changing that language. Okay. Right. We're amending the bill as introduced. So twenty one eighty five. So what's so, the language that's highlighted? Yeah. Is new. Right. So what? And it's cross-referencing 2185, which, which is... Which is what I just walked us through. Yeah. Okay. Which are those immigration statuses. Thank you. Okay. Does that make sense? It makes those okay. sense. Thank you for clarifying. Um, and again, that was a recommendation from VSAC. So I think that works completely for legal reasons. I would just, my advice to you all would be, um, is or my question to you all would be, is that is, are those the communities that you want to... Um, meet with this language. Because it, it's, um, as I think I've mentioned, um, like especially when we're talking about, um, everyone uses the term Afghan refugees, mm -hmm. but many of them are actually here under humanitarian parole, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're throwing around these different immigration statuses that none, none of us are qualified to really understand, <laughs> right? Um, 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 I would just want to make sure that you all know who you are um, impacting with this legislation. And so if you're comfortable with this language, great. If you're not, if you're concerned that you're leaving someone out or you are including a community that you don't need to include, let's figure out the right people to talk to. We have a copy of that to. here, 2185, you just referenced. Of what? Of the uh, of section cross section. Uh, no, but I can send it to Morgan. Yeah, that would be Did great. I send that to you, Morgan? No? I don't think so. Okay. And do you mind just repeating uh, <laughs> who we're capturing in this so I yes. can hear it one more time? Mm -hmm. Thanks. <clears throat> so, if you don't mind printing out five copies, someone who qualifies as a refugee pursuant to the federal definition of a refugee, yep. humanitarian parolees, mm -hmm. and someone who has been issued a special immigrant visa pursuant to the Afghan Allies Protection Act of 2009 as amended. Um, and then, um, anybody have any questions on that? We'll 
get it printed up, and I'm going to pull up the note I have from joint fiscal ones. Please go ahead. And then um, this was not in the bill as introduced, but was a recommendation of VSAC, so I've included it for you all to consider. Page two, adding a new, a brand new section, um, incentive grant eligibility. So section one, and the bill is introduced, was only for advancement grants. Section two would be a change to eligibility for incentive grants, and I'm pulling up incentive grants. So I can read to you there a need-based grant program to aid students who need financial assistance and are pursuing undergraduate studies and give promise of completing satisfactorily a degree program or who have been accepted for admission to an approved post-secondary um, education institution for undergraduate studies. So remember, advancement grants are for non, um, I don't want to get it wrong, non-degree education and incentive grants contemplate that you are seeking a degree. Um, right, it says it right in there, completing, set promise of completing satisfactorily a degree program. So section two is making um, essentially the same change to eligibility requirements. Incentive grants also have a one-year residency requirement as does the residency requirement comes from the definition of resident for all of these acts programs in this title, uh, or in this chapter. Um, so notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, a person who qualifies for in-state tuition to CCV pursuant to the language we just walked through, so refugees, humanitarian parolees, um, and Afghan Allies Protection Act, um, special immigrant visa holders, um, shall not be ineligible for the Vermont Incentive Grant Program solely on account of that person's residency status. So again, making that same residency exception for the um, incentive grant. The big difference here is that what VSAC is proposing is that this is a temporary, um, the section one would be amending the green books. So the thought there is that it's in perpetuity until you change it all. Section two is a piece of session law. Mm -hmm with a repeal date built in, so three years from now. This language actually appeared in the same bill that amended the CCV in-state tuition language as a piece of session law for one year. It, re it was repealed, I believe, or two years. It was repealed July 1, 2023, I believe. Um, so my understanding is that VSAC is re recommending that we um, try this again for three more years. So this is already in law use of her No, session. It, it ran out. It, it ran was out. repealed um, on July 1, 2023. So just, Got just it. past July. Okay. So this is continuing. For until July 1, 2027. Yeah. Or, you know, whatever date you all pick. So this would just be going back to the way it was just well, for that one year. Yeah. For that one year. Yeah. From July 1, 2022 to July 1, 2023. Yes. Okay. And I heard back from Ms. Richter. She doesn't see a fiscal impact. When she doesn't see S191 as having a fiscal impact. And I think it's probably because, and I'll go back and confirm this with folks, that the dollars are coming from dollars that have already been appropriated or will be appropriated to VSAC itself. So I think what Tom said, and I could be wrong, that their budget can withstand this additional uh, request, these additional um, hits, if you will. But I'll go back and confirm for that. Yeah. It's kind of an odd perspective. That is a fiscal impact. Because if the money weren't used, the money would roll back and just become liquid for some other so I have their email, I'll forward it along to everybody, or have Morgan print it out. I th so we won't be in, and we can always have print, we won't be allocating, appropriating more money because of this. That I guess. So we'll take his budget, which has already been, you know, either last year's budget, this year's budget, and pull from that. And, and I think, and I could be wrong, we can have her in, I think it's a good idea to talk about this, when she says there's no expected fiscal impact on S191, therefore no uh, no formal fiscal notes required, I wonder if she sort of interprets that because we are not going to appropriate a certain amount specific to that. So we can, you know, we can. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah. That's it. That's those. That's those are the changes to the bill as introduced. Yeah, please. So, to your comment about no one here being really qualified to fully uh, explain or uh, dissect the status of the meaning of refugee, et cetera. Oh, no, that's not what I meant. I meant every immigration status and who qualifies under that immigration status. Okay, so so how do we, right, but how do we, so I, I understand humanitarian parole gets put for The Afghan issue, I understand. But the refugee status, my understanding, again, I'm not an immigration lawyer, but it's a rather broad characterization and it incorporates political refugee, economic refugee, et cetera, et cetera, natural disaster refugee. I mean, we do need to understand that before we can really uh, decide if this is an appropriate use of state treasury. I, I can read you the definition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm pulling it up right now. Um, and I forgive me if my comment was um, not helpful. Um, I meant as you all are trying to determine what categories, what communities you are trying to serve with this language. There are many, many, many immigration statuses and immigration statuses within immigration statuses. So just saying, I, there are folks from X country in my community and I want to make sure that, that they are served, we would need to figure out what is their immigration status. Um, and that's not something that I'm qualified to figure out. We would need to, to talk to those communities. Um, so let's see. The definition, the federal definition of immigration is? Immigration or refugee? I'm sorry, re refugee. Any person who is outside any country of such person's nationality, or in the case of a person having no nationality, is outside any country in which such person last habitually resided, and who is unable or unwilling to return to, and is unable or unwilling to avail him or herself of the protection of that country because of persecution or a well-founded fear of persecution on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, that was A, or in such special circumstances as the president after appropriate consultation may specify, any person who is within the country of such person's nationality, or in the case of a person having no nationality, within the country in which such person is habitually residing, and who is persecuted or has well-founded fear. So that, um, so that's, so outside of their country or in their country. The term refugee does not include any poor person who is ordered, incited, assisted, or otherwise participated in the persecution of any person on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. Um, and I think that's, there's some more to it, but I, um, I think for the purposes of our, I can um, send this. Section. Um, yep, I'll send this to um, Morgan. Morgan. To Morgan to post. Um, but that yes, that is a broad definition. It also takes some time to actually get refugee status, doesn't it? I mean, my understanding is that if you show up to our country seeking asylum, you're an asylum seeker, and then there's and then you have to go through a process that involves court to get that refugee status. And I think maybe I'd follow up with an immigration attorney for that, but. That's, that's my recollection. Yes, yeah, so I, that, I, I think you're kind of hitting on what I'm trying to highlight for you. Asylum seekers or asylees would not be, I don't right. believe, included right. in um, the carve out here. And so that's why figuring out the community you want to be serving with this language is so important because you may, the constituents that came to you or the constituents that you were working with may not be affected by this thing. I don't know who they were, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but yes. Um, and I had, when I was drafting the language for the Community College of Vermont, I believe I had been in touch with someone at the at Vermont Law School um, who worked in the immigration clinic there who helped me. So um, I could find their name, perhaps, um, and 
can either reach out or put you in touch or have them testify. Um, but no. if you know anecdotally, these are the people in my community or a community that, that and here's their immigration status, I can trace that back and try and find some language for you, but I'm not going to be able to come up with every immigration status that's here in the in Vermont, right? I do know an immigration lawyer in Burlington. Um, I could pick his brain for a little bit. Or even have him testify. Or the person who uh, Beth mentioned. There's one in Burlington, too. No. Uh, so for this bill, right now, the main witness I have coming back in is Julia Richter to sort of talk us through the financial, possible financial impacts. Anybody else want to hear from somebody? Do you want to hear from a particular immigration attorney on this? Uh, or do you want us I mean, to? I mean, I could, I could follow, well, I guess uh, that would be up to the rest of the committee if you want to hear from an immigration attorney who I'm sure he'd be willing to testify. I don't want to assume for him, but I'm sure he'd be willing to. He's worked with Afghan refugees and would be able to clarify the, the process that, you know, you're not, you don't have refugee status the second you show up here, you know, you have asylum seeker status and you have to go through this uh, court procedure to actually be granted refugee status, but that's not an area that I have an expertise in and I want to confirm or clarify that. So if, uh, yeah. Well, I think it would be a good use of, you know, 10 minutes of Zoom time yep. just yeah. to kind of make sure we get all the, yeah. can't, can't make a decision based on what we think it means. Yeah, Using oh, any charges? I'm, I'm fine with that, yeah. <laughs> what was that? Using any charges? Oh, uh, <laughs> I can ask him. Uh, Pro bono. His name? Yeah. Can you give me? Uh, let me, I'd have to double check okay. my email. But yeah. Anybody want to hear from anyone else in addition to the attorney and Julia Richter on this or any red flags? Anything else on this? So, so yeah, please. Going back to your earlier comment, do you think Julia would be uh, or someone would be able to quantify this. Like, I, I know that there's, you know, there's money to potentially scrape up. I get that. But yeah. yeah. What is the impact? Is it I think Scott bucks? would be able to answer. Scott would probably be able to. Yeah. The VSAC guy. Um, we could ask Scott just to how much are we looking at for well, this budget. The CFO might. Yeah. Have, or I guess Scott. I mean, yeah. Fine yeah. No, it's a good point. I'm, yeah. Junior. He's thinking uh, chief financial officer. Chief financial officer. Yeah. Um, CFO. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, I think we're pretty good. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see what they're thinking, because they must be anticipating some number, and, and they can't be anticipating. I'm guessing they're not anticipating thousand, but where are they getting their hundred or twenty? Or I think it would honestly just be a couple dozen. Yeah. I'll we'll talk about that. You said, "Great, beautiful." Okay, Ms. St. James, one seventy-one. On? Unless you have any other comments around this. No. Do you have any homework for me on this? Though? I don't think so. I think we'll just we'll have the Senator Hachim will set up the immigration attorney. We have Julia Richter. Uh, we're going to set up for next week as well as. The CFO from BSAC will dig up that person or, we'll, or their designee and go from there. And then I think we'll be ready to roll. Yeah, please. Just uh, for your information, the, the Dr. Levine's testimony is on the website. Oh, thank you. Oh, that was fast. Morning. That is fast. Great. Terrific. So S-171, this is Senator Ram Hinsdale's, an act relating to legal residency of a student following displacement by natural disaster. We're going to look at a few definitions. We'd ask you to do that. And I'm wondering, uh, I think we have to put a whole thing in our files. You wouldn't mind filling us in. Sure. Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. Um, my charge for today was to help come back with some information, some potential definitions, anything I could find out there for natural disaster and displacement. And it's not good news. <laughs> okay. Um, and just to remind everyone, uh, 
one of you who are a lot smarter than I am. What was, is McKinney Bento? McKinney Bento. Bento, okay. For homeless students. Homeless so students, yes. Remember, we this bill proposes to add a section to section 1075 of Title 16, uh -huh. which is the legal residency statute for how we figure out what school district a kiddo belongs to. Okay. okay. And generally speaking, we figure that out by looking at where the legal guardians are residing. So if the legal guardians of a, of a, of a child are residing, they're domiciled mm -hmm. in a school district, Yeah. That's where that child goes. Yeah. The statute also has provisions for state-placed students, so students that are in state custody for CHIMS cases. Okay. That, that's just one example. So just continuing that thought, so if somebody's been removed from their home. Correct. There's they already statute dealing student. with where the foster home is. Exactly. He or she exactly. may return to that exactly. school for unlimited period of time. Or until, uh, I don't know off the top of Okay, that's fine. Probably to, until the fostering program is over, maybe. Uh, I would have to that's okay. read the statute there. But um, the statute also has a provision for how we figure out the resident's status, so what school district a homeless student belongs to. Okay. And that's where the McKinney-Vento Act, which is federal legislation, mm -hmm. comes into play. And McKinney-Vento touches on many different things for um, secondary down, so not post-secondary, it's for uh, public school. Um, so social services, all kinds of things, schools are required to have a McKinney-Vento um, outreach coordinator, mm -hmm. right? There's like all kinds of requirements. But one of the requirements in McKinney-Vento talks about um, access to education for homeless students, right? So, um, and there's a whole bunch of, um, and I'm not the expert, you had a great, I watched the testimony you took um, from the folks from AOE about McKinney-Vento, so I am not an expert in that piece of law, but their presentation was, was very clear on the services and the rights that are afforded children that qualify as homeless under that federal legislation. Um, for state residency purposes, for how you figure out if a student, what school district a student goes to, this statute provides that um, the legal residence or residence of a child of homeless parents is the child's school of origin, which is what I believe this bill is trying to get at, right? Unless the, uh, unless the parents in another school district agree that the child's attendance in school in that school district will be in the best interest of the child. So, you know, if it's better for the child to attend the new school, then great. But a child of homeless parents is defined as a child whose parents lack a fixed, regular, and adequate residence, or they're um, currently living in a um, some sort of shelter or temporary accommodation, such as pub, uh, like a hotel for um, on a public assistance voucher. So I think the conversation you all had and the caution that you were given, um, I think slightly in my walkthrough, but certainly in the testimony that you took from AOE, was that it's possible that many children who are, I'm gonna use air quotes here, displaced by a natural disaster would fit in this homeless category. Yep. And so there's already a piece of law that would govern them, okay? Yep. But the gray area is, what is a natural disaster? Mm -hmm. And what does displacement mean? Because it's possible that um, what you all are thinking of as far as displacement mm -hmm. may not mean that someone has a lacks a fixed regular or adequate residence. Okay. Senator Weeks. I recall though that the fundamental problem was that a family who may be displaced from their original domicile, they pick up a temporary domicile, they then are not homeless because they have they Yes, have a, that's that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. Okay. So 
depending on the population you are trying to reach or the set of circumstances that you are trying to take into account, if, let's say I, uh, a student lives with their family in one school district and they, um, their home is flooded and it's not habitable and they have to move, yeah. but the family has the means Pick to up. rent a new house, buy a new house, um, et cetera, in a new school district. There's a possibility that that student would not meet the definition of a homeless student, right? right? So there would be no law that automatically entitles them to stay in the old school district. That's what this bill could do. Right. That being said, is it possible that family could petition the school board and say, hey, this is really important to us. Sure, we were able to afford a house here, but we really want Sarah to finish the school year or something like that. Yes, it's um, a little more clear for high school, a little less clear for elementary school. And okay. um, so to look at that set of circumstances, we're gonna jump to chapter 21, which is the maintenance of public schools, which is the town tuition program. Mm -hmm which is where we talk about the requirement for schools to maintain an elementary or high school or pay tuition. So for elementary schools, which is grades um, pre-kindergarten through six, um, let's see, what does it say here? We're talking about if kids get, families um, do get displaced, but they're able to afford a new house somewhere and they still want their kid to go to that school could they petition their school board so the elementary school yep. says um, you got to maintain a school or provide um, to or pay tuition right yep. notwithstanding those options if a school board in a district that operates an element a school board in district that operates an elementary school may pay tuition for elementary students who reside near a public elementary school in an adjacent district if it's within the best judgment of the uh, if it's within the best interest of the student and the judgment is left up to the school board so that's very narrow for elementary school for high school it's different for high school The statute that requires a school district, if they are op if they are organized to provide high school education, they've either got to maintain a high school or pay tuition. But it also authorizes um, uh, uh, that one. Let's see. Um, um, bear with me. A school district may maintain a high school, both a high school and furnished high school education by paying tuition to a public school as, a, as in the judgment of the school board may best serve the interests of the students, or at an approved independent school um, if the school board judges that a student has unique educational needs that cannot be served within the district or at a nearby school, and the judgment of the board is final. So for elementary school, the only discretion for a school board is if you're um, border of another school district. Okay. But for high school, it's any public school or any approved independent school if it's in the best interest of the children. But if a family gets displaced and their child's in third grade, they have to then use the school that borders their other school. No. If a if a um, if a third grader is displaced. If a third grader is displaced, yeah, we haven't displaced. really determined yeah. what that means yet, but We'll just use the example of they can't live in the home that they were living in, right? Um, current law allows for their, well, it, it depends. They might meet the definition of homeless, mm -hmm. in which case they would be able to stay in their school of origin. Yep. Um, right, right. If they don't meet the definition of homeless, I think they could still petition their school board uh, it would depend on I guess if they don't meet the definition of homeless then they probably are a resident of the new school district considered a resident of this new school district and if they were in third grade 
and you were a resident of the new school district, you could petition that new school board to, and you were on the border of your old school board or school district, you could petition to go to the old school district. The school district does not have to say yes. But also, within the legal residency statute, if there is a dispute about residency, the secretary makes a final decision. Oh. Oh. Um, in fact, any interested person or taxpayer who is dissatisfied <laughs> with the decision of the school board as to the student's legal residency may appeal to the secretary. So there Michelle. are a lot of avenues yeah. here. Yes. But may I ask one question, and I'm sure I'm missing something. What if this committee were just to say, given, I think, Senator Chittenden's bill and Senator Rom Hinsdale's bill, what if we were to say, no matter what your circumstance, if your family's transferred or you buy a new house or anything, that you can finish that one school year? So what am I, because I'm looking at the committee. It seems like you could, though, with a, with a petition to the Secretary of Ed. Well, it's contingent upon her so actually think, giving the okay, right? The green light. Yeah. So there, you could you could get you could petition your school board, and the school board could say great. Yeah. Um, or they could say no. Or they could say no. You could petition um, this, and so that's for paying tuition. If it's a if it's a town that maintains a school district or uh, operates school, if the town is a tuitioning town. That piece of law that we just walked through would not apply. It doesn't. That law doesn't say if you're a tuitioning town. I mean, if you're a tuitioning town, you need to go wherever you want anyway. If you, if it's just if you lived in an operating district. I guess for me, I'm just interested. If some child, it's January, wherever they are going to school, that they can just stay at that school and just wrap things up, if that just feels right to them and their family. Senator Hewlett. I was just going to suggest maybe we could hear from some superintendents because now that we're talking about this, I know it's come before. I know it ha right it's come right. before our my, the school board that I serve on, and I know that we've had these discussions okay. before. And I feel like there's oftentimes, at least within like a uh, like maybe even the county, I think superintendents work with each other to make sure that generally this kind of thing works yeah, out. Yeah, I think so. So if the elementary school language is the least restrictive. It's the most restrictive right okay. now. Okay, so yeah. how about if we just change, the, change the language to the one that's least restrictive. Right. And that's make the other one the same. Yeah. Uh, require change of statute. So, yes, everything you guys yes. do likely yeah. requires right. a change of statute. Okay. Um, that only, so that language is specific to bordering. So you would, that would only work if the district that you moved into bordered your district of origin or your school of origin. But I think what Senator Williams is saying, I could be, you might be saying the same thing, is if we were to make the elementary program, the language mm -hmm. mirror the 9 through 12 language. Oh, that's not what I heard him saying, but sure, you could do yeah. that. Because that makes it makes them both equal and maybe gives people a little more flexibility. You can certainly do that. Again, okay. it's discretionary yeah. to the yeah. school board. You know. we'll hear from, yeah, I think it's a good idea. We should hear from school boards and the superintendents association on this and see what people think. I mean, for me, it just seems like for a kid to have to make new friends middle of the year rather than the new year. So then you, I would say. So I wasn't the most popular kid in town, so sometimes it was a struggle if I was in, if it was September or January. So I would encourage you to think about how long. Sounds yeah. like you're circling just finishing the school year. Just throwing and it then, out, yeah. Um, transportation is not required. That was part of it, yeah. Period, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's discretionary for school districts. Yeah. So if you live in a school district with a transportation you know, policy, and you're staying in the school district, but you've moved out of the school district, how does transportation factor into that? Um, I believe there's already some language um, somewhere that we might be able to draw on. But you could certainly say, you could either make transportation discretionary in the school districts and let the school district decide if they're gonna provide transportation if they do for everyone else. 
you could say under no circumstances, it's the parent's responsibility if they're taking advantage of this provision. Um, you know, or you know, we can craft something. I kind of lost track under there for a second. Are you are you referring to any family that decides to move during the year that they would be allowed to finish the school year or yeah. displaced families? Yeah, I'm just work? thinking maybe the cleanest way to do it, the easiest, is if no matter what their circumstance, if they want their child to finish their academic year there and transportation, you know, they're going to do the transportation and everything, probably talking 10 kids. I, I don't know if we can ask the Superintendent's Association, but it seems to me like it would be a good thing for the kid. Especially if they've already paid their property taxes there. I'm just thinking, in, yeah. yeah, but we can have them come in and, it, I mean, it gets rid of the the whole, what's a disaster, <coughs> what's not a natural disaster, who think, you know, that right. sort of thing, but we can hear from folks. Please, go ahead, Ms. No, Asian. I was just thinking about how tuition factors into all of this, but if it's just for the finishing the school year, maybe that's not... And we want them to stay at that same school. This right. isn't like, okay. Right, but I'm just thinking of the family that moves into an operating town out of a tuitioning district, right? If it's just one school year, they could yeah. remain in that potentially approved independent school. Um, but if you were to go any more, if you were to go, let's say, till graduation or something like that, okay. you would be having yeah. folks who are moving into an operating school district allowed to tuition to the school of their choice right just because their family decided to move right. into an operating school district I don't think that's a time. yeah so you're saying if somebody is in a non-operating district and they move to an operating no you're saying if they're in an operating and they move to a no if they're sorry if they're in a non-operating district yeah and they move to an operating district yes this bill would allow them to continue receiving tuition, right. or this idea yeah. would allow them to continue to receive tuition until however long you all decide. And so I could imagine yeah. different math depending on how long, um, but, literally math as far as cost, right? Yeah. Like, you know. But are you, would you be, yeah, if, if we were to let it go on and on and on, yeah, I mean, there could be a, more of a fiscal impact yeah. with that versus, um, you know, finishing the school year. Okay. But that, but that's a policy decision, so. Right. No, but I think, I perfectly again, just speaking for myself, if a family wants their kid to finish the school, a couple months there, whatever, hate to see this huge process have to happen where they're petitioning people and everything but if it generally works out you can keep it as is but, okay anything else on this no I will just note that there is no definition for natural, natural right disaster. and that's where this sort of maybe cleans that just uh, done a little bit more easily um, yeah I love that <laughs> Um, Any homework for me on this bill? No, I'm going to ask Morgan to ask the Superintendent's Association, the School Board Association. Here you go, Morgan. You can ask them that question. So I'll have them in next week, and hopefully, and I'll talk to Senator Ron Hinsdale. I could, I could see if you were in high school and you're like a, a junior and you're playing sports. And, totally. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. yeah. If you're in elementary school, it's not such a big deal. You know, right. you know, you have your little buddies yeah. or whatever, and yeah. Uh, just a comment that uh, you know, often families make um, uh, job decisions that affect where they live and where they work, and affects where they live, where they go to school, and those are decisions that families uh, make all the time. And I'm not sure that uh, you know. I, I understand the displaced by natural disaster, mm -hmm. but. To, to then shift more towards a, um, you know, uh, kind of a more uh, softer approach to, you know, uh, pick your pick pick your pick your job and then you know pick your school. Uh, uh, it's kind of uh, kind of.
kind of a collateral support by this legislation. Uh, on Tell me a little bit more about what you mean. So, well, so, so which part? Because well, so if you so this scenario where all of a sudden that a kid's in 10th grade and the parents are moving four miles away, but it puts him or her in this new district. If the committee wanted to move in this direction, he or she could stay at that original district until January, until the end of school year. Right. Tell me your, a little bit more about the concern. Well, I just, um, you know, I, I understand the premise. Yeah, But yeah. I also understand that, you know, parents are making decisions all the time about sure. you know, following the job, following, essentially following the money. And um, I'm just not sure that, uh, you know, those kinds of decisions uh, need to be reflected in legislation uh, to basically, uh, you know, place their Com kids. Common benefit. Yeah, the benefit is for the family, not for the community. So I, I'm just ambivalent about it. You know, having, yeah, no, yeah. As a kid, I, a military kid. Yeah. I, I, I did probably three schools where it was halfway through the year. Yeah. It's not a crisis. You, you know, the benefit is you're shifting into your new location earlier rather than lingering and waiting. It's just a different perspective. That's a really good point also. Fair enough, yeah. I mean, the parents could also say, Come on, Sally, you're coming with us. If that were, they thought that was best completely. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So, anyway, I'm listening. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The natural disaster bit, yeah, that's got some relevance. Yeah. Okay, I get that. But but uh, broadening it out, mm, you know, it's a two edged yeah, sword. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good point. I yeah. would like to leave Senator Graham Hinsdale happy, too. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Why don't we take five minutes until our folks from the school board from the uh, we have one more. Uh, <laughs> this is a marathon. <laughs> oh, oh this is it. We've got well, that's oh. 303. We have just some brief testimony. This is thanks, Bill. Uh, hey, yes, thank, thank you, thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. What about we can families go that are, have deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf? Cemetery. Oh yeah, I might cure it's it. Bedtime. It's bedtime. It's <laughs> bedtime. <laughs> Great. Uh, welcome back to Senate Education. Final uh, business for the day. We are yesterday, and we're so pleased to have the three of you with us, talking about uh, S-303, an act relating to support for Vermont's young readers. And one of the things we have been talking about, if you've followed our work, is whether or not we should have principals, superintendents, other administrative staff take the 46-hour modules that we're having teachers take. And so, Ms. Myers, we'll start with you. Uh, your thoughts. Hi, Chelsea Myers, Associate Executive Director for VSA on the record, for the record. Um, I just want to, I've been listening a little bit today, um, introduce or reintroduce Amy Miner, who is not only our VSA president, but also I've heard you saying a lot about the Standards Board for Professional Educators. She is also the chair of that group. Um, so I figured inviting her and having her available um, to answer some of those questions with her vantage point on that Standards Board would be helpful. Um, we do have some brief testimony to read. Is that what you would like, or do you want to just go into a discussion? I mean, let, listen, I, I think you, generally, do you think edu, you know administrators should go through this training? Maybe start there. I think my first response to that would be, um, I have not gone through all of the forty six modules. Okay. Uh, I haven't done all of the hours. I did sign up and I was able to complete module number one. Okay. And so, um, you know, I'm going to answer based on on that premise. I think um, if in most cases and a building administrator is evaluating the performance in the classroom of a classroom teacher. And okay. so if we are wanting administrators to be able to improve classroom instructional practices, they have to understand what we are looking for um, from, instru from instruction. And so I think there is a connection with 
if you want to transform literacy education in a school district, I think your administrators have to be in alignment with what those goals are in order to drive action plans and give feedback on what's happening uh, in a classroom. So you would say yes? I would most likely yeah, say yes. Yeah, do they need yeah, to do yeah, all of those 46 hours? That's um, really hard for me to answer without moving through the training. I, I will say, um, you know, I have some questions about the online modules um, mm -hmm. that are on the AOE website. I think um, really strong professional development can absolutely impact a student's learning and experience and the level of instruction that teachers provide. I'm not sure what I've experienced thus far in the modules mm -hmm. is engaging and will directly result um, in an entire school district moving their literacy instruction just because I haven't moved um, through those modules. Um, and so the delivery model for me was part of one of you know my concerns, um, just looking at section two um, and that last se sentence of section 2B where it talks about um, developed and offered or approved by the AOE. I think yeah. our Every teacher wants and every administrator wants students to have high literacy scores, right? As an administrator, my hope is that every student in my school district is on grade level for reading by the end of grade three, because in order to access the content that starts in grade four, you have to be a really strong reader. So not being on grade level can be a challenge there. Um, I think for me, I would love to see that language involve having the AOE not be the only driver of those decisions, but having a committee that involves teachers, administrators, and the AOE working together to develop this literacy training and to approve the literacy training, that would really, I think, improve the relationship, the fidelity of what we're trying to change, um, and the understanding of why this literacy training is important. So that could be, uh, we might already have that set up in the literacy, with the literacy council. Mm. Maybe, I don't know. Yep, when I read through that uh, literacy council section, that connection yeah. wasn't made strong enough for me. And okay. so I think if you could make that more um, explicit, I think that that might be helpful. I think my biggest concern is if we're going to require teachers to do any amount of training, we mm -hmm. really need to make sure it's going to be relevant to what's happening in their district and in their classroom, engaging and impactful. And so I think trying to build that is a great spot for collaboration. Sarah, if you look at your precincts, we could. No, I, no, it was about the camera. Oh. But no, um, I, that's a really um, great observation and suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very good. So yeah, we can talk, we can, uh, as a committee, we can talk a little bit about that. I, I like what you're saying, um, have a, a group of people. So for example, what I'm imagining is if a teacher says, all right, well, I'm now taking this literacy class. It's a three or four credit class. Why do I need to do both? And does this equate is this good enough for what would happen in the modules? This group of people could have those conversations and decide. And it sounds like that would be a great group of people to actually decide. Yeah, that that's that's exactly what we, we want you to be doing. Uh, and so, Ms. Minor, I would just say, if in all of your free time, which I know you have just <laughs> literally none of, if you can think about who would might those three to five people be, if uh that would work with teachers and others on determining that, that would be great. Yeah, I think it would really be important to have teachers. Like that. Yeah, yeah, and that buy-in, you know, okay, it's not just the agency of education that's secretary saying, yes, that's good, it's bad, but, the, but a group, yeah. Exactly, and I think for me, when I started to go through the modules that I was doing, um, you know, the modules provide great information, but what is a challenge is that disconnect between the work that's happening in your building based on your building's action plan and, and scores 
and me as an individual classroom teacher moving through a self-paced module where I can play and answer some, I can play kind of the, um, yeah. the recording and then answer. That is not always the most effective modality to change my classroom practice. So if there was a connection, uh, I we're thinking about how can districts deliver this um, so that it really is impacting more than um, me just doing this to get my 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 licensure renewal, which That's is right. That's right. That's right. Senator right. Dewitt. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Amy. How do you feel about coaches and their ability to transform the our current situation? I think that coaches are critical. Um, we have seen tremendous math um, growth in our district uh, with our math coaches. Uh, we have added reading interventionists. Uh, one of our areas of growth would be to provide more coaching specifically in the area of reading instruction. And so what is helpful about a coach is that real-time feedback. Coaches can do modeling of a new strategy um, so that the teacher can watch that and practice. Coaches can give real-time feedback when teachers are doing small group or large group instruction with a reading strategy. And so I think they play a really important role of taking the textbook knowledge that you need to learn around what is best practice and then to transform that into application that becomes natural for every classroom teacher. What's your district, may I ask, Ms. Miner? I'm in, Col I'm in Colchester. In Colchester, great, great. Yeah, we talked a little bit, I mean, one of the things, committee will correct me if I'm wrong, with the coaching piece is the, I mean, we're, it's so hard to find teachers right now and coaches and paras, it's, but I get it, having somebody there would make a, a huge difference. Yeah, it's, it's that, you know, you can take a course and you can move through a module and have a level of, a, of, a, of understanding, but yeah. then being able to apply that new skill, the coaches and the building level administrators have an important role in that, especially if you want those new skills to be implemented with fidelity in a building, in a district, across the state. So I may have a misunderstanding uh, then of the coaches. So would coaches be people who you might already have employed in, for example, third grade teachers, also the coach, that kind of thing? Fourth grade teachers is a coach. I think there's different models for yeah. how districts use coaches based on the resources and the FTEs that you have. Sometimes right. that might be a side stipend. It doesn't necessarily need to be a full um, time position. Great. Uh, so in addition to thinking about a little bit about what this committee makeup might look like, if you've got a rock star coach in your district, and I'm sure you do, uh, it'd be great to have a conversation with him or her at some point, and maybe you could just pass that information along to Morgan, just so you know. We we throw these words around. Sometimes I assume, oh, that's this, but it it would be great to talk with somebody and how they work and how they operate. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, so Chelsea, do you have anything else uh, that you want to add before we switch to Mr. Nichols? Yeah. Just. Um... A couple of questions or just observations about the bill in terms of, I do recognize that you've been talking a lot about those online modules and talking about that as a requirement, but in, in the bill, I'm not sure that it is quite clear that the modules, the online modules are that the training required itself. And especially when you add the provision of, it can also be approved by the agency of education. It's not clear, for example, the number of hours or the type of training. Um, so I think just more clarity around that and the um, kind of dosage of the training would be super helpful. Um, we're definitely in support of continuing the literacy council um, and just have some further questions that I'm happy to provide in our written te testimony, I'll send it after. And Amy, I've read her testimony as well, has a couple of those questions um, that you could just look over. Um, I know you've had a marathon afternoon, so I'll send that. That would that be great, Chelsea, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. that, would be, that would be terrific. Uh, anything that you, and you've seen draft 2.1. Yeah, so yeah. any kind of clarifying questions, 
if you would send them along to uh, us and copy Ledge Council as well, that would be that'd be great to kind of keep this all moving and fluid. Um, but Ms. Myers, on the topic specifically, anything else to add around the training piece of, of administrators? It sounds like, and I don't want to put words in Ms. Myers' mouth, but you know, again, if you're going to be evaluating teachers, uh, good practice to have this have similar training. Yeah, I echo what Amy said and also just would add that she surfaced a lot of like the best practices in professional learning, um, which I spend a lot of time with, um, like things like coaching and putting into practice and things like that. So we just have questions about how those modules would translate to some of those best practices in professional learning, um, but agree that administrators have to have the knowledge in which they're um, evaluating and giving feedback to teachers on in order to effectively be coaching those educators um, in their practice. Um, so yes, completely agree with Amy. And I would just, the last sentiment is, I think it was Senator Weeks yesterday asked about kind of like, how do we know if we're successful? So if we give 46 hours of training, is there a mechanism in which we're going to assess in a couple of years? If, um, uh, teachers feel, for example, more effective in teaching literacy, and if if literacy skill scores are going, while not necessarily causal, if they're going up in the state of Vermont. Yeah. Great. Thank you both so so much, Mr. Nichols. Can you top that, or do you just wanna, <laughs> or you just wanna call it a day? Well, <clears throat> I I wrote down some notes, and I can actually type it up into testimony and send it to you folks. I don't disagree with anything that Amy and Chelsea said. And I've only had, I looked at the bill last night um, after I got okay. home from Montpelier, it was about 7.30, typed some things up. And I, I was thinking that the bill was requiring all licensed educators to go through the modules. That's how I read it. And maybe yeah. I read it too quick. Now that's how I read it as well, but I want, but we'll check into uh, with our like, council, but our question specifically for you is whether, let's say it, we want to know if, if administrators should be pulled into this. Are you talking K-4 administrators? But we're talking K-12 administrators. Yeah, so I would think about that a little bit with high school administrators, whether or not we'd want to go down that road. I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, but if I'm a high school principal and I'm I'm responsible for the physics teacher and for the AP chemistry teacher and AP government teacher, typically if I'm an administrator in a high school, I'm not going to have the content knowledge in every single area that I'm going to be responsible for. Fair enough. Uh, but I am going to have, hopefully, a real strong understanding of pedagogy. Um, I think with reading, it's a little bit different at the K-4 level, I used to, as a superintendent, tell my administrators that when the teachers are getting trained in, and I'm just making this up, math land, for example, yeah. you need to be there getting the training with them so you are really clear on the practices you expect to see in the classroom and so that you can reinforce those best practices. I think the same thing holds true for reading. So if I'm a K-4 principal or, K or elementary principal, K-5, K-8, and our teachers are being trained in uh, these modules that hopefully are approved and not just by the AOA. I'm fully, I think the licensing, the uh, literacy council that we've talked about before, I think that group should be very important in this. People like Gwen Camoli that, that are real experts in literacy should be helping the AOE make sure that whatever programs are requiring of school principals and educators that are teaching reading, that they are, you know, that are their research base, that they're effective and that the training that they are receiving you know, the module part scares me a little bit. I think there's a lot of power in coming together. Humans are social animals and working with other people uh, in a group together. Maybe you're taking the modules and then you're you're talking about them together. You're working on implementation together. I think there's a lot to be said for that. I would not want to be a check the box exercise where I just go through modules on my own while I'm drinking wine at night or whatever. I don't drink wine, but if I did and check in the box. So I would really want to make sure that there was a way to to really make sure that the actual learning that we want to see occur happens. I think it's a great point. And uh, the other witnesses made it as well. Is there a way to, again, maybe as Senator Hewlett 
mentioned incorporate a coach or or you know have sort of this stuff happen in districts in a, in a different way just not like you're saying checking off the box i know ms myers was very and well so were you instrumental when we put this money toward this but you don't want it to just be hey i did this and it not be as deep and as meaningful as it possibly could be sure. and yet you also want to recognize teachers are incredibly busy letting them do it some of this when they have the time to do it also seems to make sense yeah i think flexibility is important and you know it's one of those things where where are you going to be loose and where are you going to be tight and i yeah. think you need to be tight on this needs to happen. We need to make sure that we're really strong, especially in, in pre-K through third grade, at least, and really um, understanding that reading is a is a dynamic field, and new findings are continue to emerge, and researchers are increasingly, you know, considering the intersection of traditional literacy with digital literacy, for example, something yeah. we talked about a little bit in this committee, which is becoming more relevant, you know, in, in the twenty first century, wow. and. The research on reading continues to, to inform educational practices and policies across the world. So we want to make sure we're tapping into that, having the, the, the it's just like being a doctor, right? Or being a, I just got a tooth pulled yesterday. So being a dentist, you know, you want people with the latest research techniques that are doing the best job they can. And we want to make sure that our pre-service training in our colleges through the ROPA process, there really is more of a focus on literacy teaching. I, I have teachers tell me that they had one class in teaching literacy. And they're coming out with a degree to teach college and uh, to teach uh, in the elementary school from our colleges, and they're nowhere near ready. So I think focusing on oh, that. Yeah, no question yeah, about that. Too. Yeah. yeah. Now, and then, it, it's and then to Amy's situation. point, yeah, and to Amy's point, um, I might have a instructional coach in my system, let's, you know, any town school district, and that person yeah. might be the best person to help organize this for our group. In another district, it might be one of the principals who used to be. Uh, reading instructor and has a master's in reading. Another place it might be, you know what, well, we're going to work with this consultant who's really strong in this area. And I think all those have merit. Statewide average for ninth grade language arts proficiency, which I know isn't literacy, you know, 36.7% in the state of Vermont. That's a, that's a real problem. It is a problem. There's a question of whether or not it's real or not. Uh, because as we know, you know, every year we have we have kids that take five minutes to take the test uh, when it's when it's the NAEP assessment or even, and we can't, we don't know if a kid, a kids are really trying or not, or so there's all those factors too. A better assessment is our local, our local assessment system should really be able to give us a good idea of, of whether kids are on grade or close to on grade level. And many yeah. kids start out in kindergarten already three years behind. And it's one of the reasons why the VPA keeps pushing for preschool because we, the research is pretty clear that preschool helps helps uh you know helps fix that gap but but even that said when we're doing our local our own local assessments you're absolutely right we do not have enough kids where they're supposed to be by the end of third grade and certainly not in the upper grades either so attention we have districts as low as 12 percent we have districts you know 27 percent yeah. yeah yeah we it's an it's an issue you're absolutely right it's our number yeah. one academic issue yeah. yeah okay great this has been incredibly helpful Ms. Minor, don't be a stranger. For some reason, we don't have an opportunity. I, we know you have another full-time job, but um, <laughs> your testimony is great and very helpful. Great. Happy to uh, assist anytime. Chelsea, thanks a million. If you don't mind sending those questions along, that would be great. Jay, not bad. Not bad. <laughs> you did okay. Overall? I'm never going to get to Chelsea's standard. But nah, that's all right. For 4.55 in the afternoon, not bad. Uh, I just, thanks, I just Jay. Send to Morgan, so I really appreciate it. And I'll send Morgan my, my remark too. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Happy Valentine's Day. Okay, thanks, everybody. I think we're done. So, are we off now? We're off now. Yeah.